In this episode, I answer four very unique questions about the underground storage fuel tanks. Some of these are very unique problems. These problems can happen to any gas station operators. I highly recommend you listen to this episode and take notes. Welcome to the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast, where you can learn all the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money. This podcast is brought to you by the good folks at CSB Academy Publishing Company. And now, here is your host, Shabir Hossein. Welcome to Gas Station Business 101 Podcast. I am Shabir Hussain, and this is episode number 50. Well, this is the 50th episode. So this is a big step for all of us, because I believe this is half a century. Uh, so we have come a long way, starting with number one and to episode number 50. I'm glad that I'm here, and I'm glad that you were here listening to that episode. I didn't think I would make it to 50, but since we have reached, we have made it to 50, I'm sure we'll make it to 100 and 200 maybe some days ahead of us soon. Well, again, as I said, this is episode number 50, and today's episode is somewhat unique because this is not a Q&A session, but this is still a episode dedicated to one topic and only answering questions from our listeners. So there are four questions that I will be answering in this episode, all about underground storage tanks. And that's the topic today. And I know we covered uh, storage tank issues and risk factors in previous episodes Especially back in episode 40 and 41, I spoke in length about some of the risk factors that come with buying a gas station business. And in those two episodes, I covered some of the risk associated with underground storage tanks. If you haven't listened to any of those two episodes, I highly recommend that you do so. This way, you will get the complete picture because today we will be discussing some of the other type of issues that some of our listeners are facing. So we're taking a different approach, a different angle on underground storage tanks, or also known as UST. Among other things, we will be uh, looking at the underground storage tank issues from a tenant's point of view and also as a, from a landlord's point of view. You may be the one that owned the property and lease it out to somebody, then it would be from owner's point of view. And if you're leasing the property and somebody else owns that property, then we will be also discussing the tenant's point of view. But before we jump into the questions and answers, let me just give you some good news because I'm very happy. Lately, our downloads from iTunes have increase pretty much doubled uh, in last, I would say, about a month or so, even though I'm, I have not been producing four episodes a month, which I was originally planning on doing, but with other things and with other projects, I'm falling behind, but I'm still trying to do the best I can, and I appreciate you sticking with me and sending me questions and comments and word of encouragement. So I thank you for it. And also, uh, since we're on that topic, I wanted to ask if any of you listeners haven't gone to that iTunes page and given me a review, I sure would appreciate if you can take a minute out of your time, get onto iTunes page and give me a review. However way you see the episode or podcast, you can, if you can give me a review, I would think of it as an honor and a heartful thank you to you in advance for doing so. Okay, without further ado, let's get into the episode. And the first question comes from Andreas. And he wrote, I own the gas station business, but not the property. The landlord 
which is also the fuel distributor, is responsible for the underground tanks and the activities, he said, and I maintain everything above ground. In case there is a soil contamination, and I mean, I think he means by soil contamination is if there is a leak, a tank leakage or a tank replacement need, the landlord will have to take care of that. However, I would face a business interruption. It is, is it normal to include that in the lease with the landlord that in case such things happen, I will not pay rent during that time period where I can not operate my business? Even more, would the landlord indemnify me? How far can I push this in the contract? That's his question. Let me one more time explain what he's asking. He's asking, he leases a gas station business from a landlord who also happens to be the fuel distributor. So, obviously, the landlord is responsible for the tank and to repair anything that goes wrong under the ground. But his question is, if there is a leakage in the tank where the landlord has to come in and replace the tank, what happens to his business? Because he will not be able to sell fuel for maybe a month, month and a half, two months, uh, however long it takes to replace those tanks. In that event, who pays for that loss of income? He's also asking if he can put a clause in that contract or lease if in the event that that happens, that he doesn't have to pay rent for that duration of time. Andres, first of all, thank you for sending such an important question because I don't think I've covered that part as of yet. So you brought something very important to light where everybody needs to know how to handle situations such as this. And first thing first, if you're leasing the property, uh, which you are, and the landlord happens to be the fuel distributor, uh, even in the event that they are not the distributor, it's usually the landlord's responsibility to take care of anything under the ground. And it should be stated in the lease. And for any of you listeners out there haven't checked out a commercial gas station lease, you can check that out in my previous episode where I covered commercial lease. I believe it was about five episodes ago. So you can check maybe episode 43, 44, 45, one of those episodes where I talked in length about commercial lease and what to look for, what kind of red flags there are in commercial lease and whatnot. So first thing is check the lease because it should clearly explain uh, whose responsibility it is. But To your point, I'm sure it does not say in your lease uh, in the event that there is a contamination of the ground or there is a leak in the tank, uh, how you they would handle your rent situation uh, because of the business interruption. It's usually not said in the lease. But there are few ways to handle this. One is, first of all, you can ask your landlord, if you have a good relationship with them, ask them. If it is possible for them to include that clause in your lease that says in the event there is a uh, leak in the tank and in the event that they have to replace the tank where you will not be able to sell fuel, then would they consider a reduced rental structure and they are willing to put that in your lease? But chances are that they may not agree with that and this is why. First thing... In the event there is a leak, that does not necessarily mean that the tank has to be replaced. A lot of times it's the pipe that leaks and not the tank. Because lately, as I mentioned in previous episodes, most of the tanks in the United States are double fiberglass. So there is double layer of protection. And every station, pretty much every one of them, nowadays come with something called leak detection system. They come in varieties of brand names, but one popular one is called Vidaroot. It's a device with a small LCD display, usually sits in the back of your store where it gives you a printout or shows you how much fuel you have in each tank and 
uh, if all the functions are normal because these sensors automatically detect if there is a leak in your tank. So there are multiple layers of protection in, against your leak. But one thing is with all those protections, it can happen. It sure can happen. And I will include an image of a underground storage tank where you will get to see how the tank sits under the ground and how many layers of rocks and soil and everything else are underground and how sometimes the water table, you know, everywhere, if you dig deep enough, you will find water. And there are some places in coastal areas where you can dig only five feet and you will see water. So if the, and that's called the water table under the ground. So if the water table is high, there are times that the water can start pushing the tank upward and that can cause some compromise on the piping system where it may leak. So it's not uncommon, but in the event, God forbid, that happens to you, if the landlord doesn't agree to put that clause in your lease, there are other ways to handle that. For example, I'm sure you have an insurance and the landlord has insurance. So usually, if it is owned by a company or somebody else, they usually carry part of the insurance that called the property insurance. And under that property insurance, they usually have underground storage tanks that are insured by that insurance policy. And you would get a separate insurance where it would be covering you for theft, for other damages to the building, for... Um, let's say, uh, business interruption, or even in the event somebody sues you, uh, legal liability, that is. So if you can talk to your landlord and see if you guys can combine that policy into one where you would name him or he would name your company as an additional or co-insured, and you can have everything combined in one policy and there are policies, uh, those uh, that sell the commercial uh, insurance policies, they have a policy called BOP. It's called business owner's policy. And in under those policies, every type of business interruptions are covered. So in the event, let's say your store has been shut down for two months completely, then they will pay you based on your previous sales, based on your previous profit and loss statements, uh, they will pay you the income that you're losing. They will not pay you the sale amount, but they will pay you the income that you have lost. If you, if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm explaining it right. For example, let's say you were selling 80,000 gallons a month. And by selling 80,000 gallons, you were making 10 cents a gallon. So that's $8,000 of gross profit. And then you sold, let's say, $100,000 worth of inside merchandise. And you made $25,000 gross profit because, let's say, 25% margin. So your insurance company will not write you a check for $25,000 plus $8,000, which is $33,000. No, they will not do that. Instead, what they will do is they will look at your P&L for, let's say, last three or six months, and they will do an average Say after paying all the expenses, rent, uh, utility bills, payroll, everything else, after paying everything else, let's say you were making $8,000 a month, they will pay you that amount, the net income that you're losing, not the gross. But also remember, when they're going to pay you this amount, they will have to investigate to see actually if this is what you are selling. So they will be asking you for your sales tax returns and from your register, all the day closeouts. So you can't just hand them an Excel sheet, say, this is my data entry and this is what I've sold. They would want to see some proof. So they know that you're not frauding the system and they're actually paying you for the actual loss. So that is the best way, in my opinion, is to handle that loss of income. As I said, if your landlord would agree that's fine. Then they can put a clause into that lease that says in the event we will have to, uh, if we would have to replace the tanks, we will reduce your rent or eliminate your rent for that duration of time. But chances are that they may not agree to that. Instead, 
I'm sure they will also su- suggest that you get an insurance policy. But my suggestion is instead of getting a separate business interruption policy, which may cost you quite a bit of money, if you can get a BOP, which is a business owner's policy, that way you cover all the bases. For example, it's your store. All of a sudden, in a tornado, what if, what if the roof gets damaged and you get water all over your store? It's not landlord's responsibility because it's above the ground. What happens then? Well, in those type of events, or for example, whatever happened to us uh, very recently is a there was a wreck in front of our store on the road. One person hit another person coming 45 miles an hour, and that car pretty much veered off from the road, came in, hit our pump, two of them, and completely knocked them out off of the ground. And in that event, we lost quite a bit of business, and it took about a month to fix that. So what we did is we claimed it on our insurance, and they looked at how, many, how much money we're making per dispensers, and they saw the loss of gas volume. So they paid us that difference. So you see, it can happen above the ground as well. So you need to be prepared from both aspects, under the ground and above the ground. So the best way to handle this would be to get a business owner's policy that covers all the bases. And there is an episode that I've covered in length as far as how insurance works and what they pay for and how to get the best type of insurance and whatnot. So please listen to that episode as well, and you will understand that this is the best way to protect yourself because damages and natural disasters can happen from any angle, and you need to cover all of those bases. Moving on to number two. This second question comes from Tina, and she wrote, The land is owned. The business is owned but the tanks are leased. So, who insures the leased tanks? What kind of insurance? If the tanks are not double-lined, can the leased tanks be replaced through the company who is leasing them? What should be reviewed for UST, she means underground storage tanks, through the TCEQ website? Who registers the tank? How much does registration cost? Okay, let me simplify the question. What Tina is asking is, for example, let's say she owns the land of the premises, of the business. See, she also owns the business. But the tanks that she has under the ground are leased from a third person or a company. So she's asking who will provide the insurance and what kind of insurance will cover a tank that is owned by a third party. And what if the tanks are not up to standard, meaning double fiberglass wall? Can those tanks be replaced through which the company is leasing those tanks? And lastly, she asked, what should be reviewed for the USD through TCEQ? And by TCEQ, she means Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. It's similar to what I always refer to, ADEM, Alabama Department of environmental management. Every state has one of these with different types of name, but they're all doing the same thing. They're all working with the environmental management type deals that are dealing with uh, underground storage tanks along with many other things. And she lastly asked, who registers the tank and how much the tank registration cost? So there are few parts of this question. So let's get to one at a time. Tina, here are the answers. First of all, it is a very uncommon situation where the land is not owned by the person or the company that owns the tank. Usually I've noticed, I've seen many times where the building, the pumps and everything else is owned by a company and underground and the ground is owned by somebody else. But in this case, let's say you are the owner of the land and you have a third party who's owning the tank that is that sits in your own ground. So it's a little bit tricky, but the angle of approach that I would take is I would sit down with this owner of the tank and ask, first thing, what is the status of tanks? 
what are the status what size they are how old they are and when you and and l- let me answer one question real quick on that one as far as the law goes i know for alabama for a fact and i'm sure it goes for every state that whoever owns the tank has to register the tank so if the tanks are owned by a company they need to register that you cannot register it because you don't own it and as far as the cost of registration that is up to each state i know in our state it cost about $300 to register two 10000 gallon tanks uh so it it may vary but i don't think it will get to the thousands of dollars uh, it may be in california but in texas i'm sure it will be in couple of hundreds to maybe few hundred dollars to register those tanks and that is the responsibility of the owner of that tank the legal owner of that tank but since it can be it is very complicated in your situation my advice would be to talk to these people that own the tanks and ask them what type of lease uh, i'm not you didn't say what type of lease you have uh, with them but if there is a term limit i'm sure there is a term limit let's say you have 5 years left on that lease but you know the health of the tanks are not very good then you can get a company that are specialized in tank ask them to check the tanks and see with your local regulation if there is a law that says that you have to upgrade the tanks in certain number of years let's say if there is a deadline like florida had a few years ago where every gas station have had to update their tanks to double fiberglass coated tanks by year let's say i'm i'm not sure it maybe it was 2012 or 10 maybe i don't i'm not sure but in the event texas has such as law such such of those type of laws you need to find that out because it can shut your business down in the event that that law comes into effect so first thing first talk to these people find out what type of lease you have and what are the clauses in those lease and if you can buy those tanks out from them but also remember most of the lease usually have a dollar buyout at the end so in the event you only have 2 years left on that lease don't pay them anything wait for 2 years to get over and then just buy it for a dollar and then if you need to upgrade your tanks do so but in the event in your state there is no law to upgrade and the tanks are in good health in good condition don't worry about it as long as you have a monitoring system in place and there are some yearly monitoring system every state has that nowadays where you have to check you have to do certain testing by third company third party company and furnish those test results to the state so they know your tanks are in good standing and these are usually very simple tests like tank tightness test and such where they just check if there is a leak as i said if you have a vidro root type system leak detection system automatic leak detection system installed in your store that should also tell you if you're having problem but still most states now require that you do a test once a year and that can give you a lot of information as far as what's the health condition of those tanks so first you need to find out the lease how long of a lease you have and if you think talking to a local company that you have to upgrade then start getting prices but let's say on the other hand this lease will run another 15 years then in that lease document it should clearly state in the event that tank does not operate the way it should be what happens in a lease document it should completely spell out how to handle situation when they are not going the way they intended to go so i would say you need to really review that lease and if it is a very lengthy and very complicated lease you may want to pay an attorney a couple of hundred dollars to have them review that lease for you and that way in the event you need to renegotiate please do so but please read that lease and find out what are the recourses in the event it leaks and they have the lease for another 15 years what you would have to do my understanding is if they are the owner of the tanks it is their responsibility also you need to find out if they have insurance on that tank 
If not, you may have to get it insured because it is in your property. So, God forbid something happens. Guess who the state will come after? The state will come after you because you are the landowner. So, it is primarily your responsibility. And since this is a tricky situation, I would say handle it promptly, delicately, but also make sure you review the lease first. One more thing I don't think I covered. You asked who would cover the insurance or how you can get insurance. On that note, you also need to find out if the person or the company you're leasing the tanks from have insurance or not. And if they do, since you're the landowner, they need to name you as the co-insured in that insurance. But in the event they do not have insurance, you need to contact your insurance company that you have your business and the property insurance with and have them include the tanks. And this way, you may have to name them as the co-insured because they're the owner. So in the event something goes wrong, the tank owner's name will come up. And if your policy doesn't have them as the co-insured, there may be some complications. So you need to name them as the co-insured uh, in your policy in the event that they do not have insurance policy and you're including them or the tanks in your policy. But regardless, however way you do it, it has to be insured. So talk to those that company or that individual, find some details, and then make a judgment call. And if you need any help, feel free to email me. Moving on to question number three. The third question comes from Michael. And Michael writes, Hello, I enjoy your podcast very much. Great information and useful tips. Could you do a podcast on how to manage inventory effectively? Also, what do you think is the best way to handle record and comply with EUST regulation and compliance? Thank you. That's what he wrote. Okay, so it's a two-part question. One, where he wanted me to do an uh, episode where I talk about how to manage inventory. And that is on my list. And one of the next few episodes, one of those episodes will be about how to effectively manage inventory. So look out for that. But this episode is about UST, underground storage tank. So I will answer his second question first. And his question is how to handle the record keeping of the underground storage tank based on the regulations so he can be in compliance? Well, very good question because I don't think I covered that either. So here it is, Michael. One record keeping part that we have to all do, uh, and I'm not sure which state you're in, but most of the states nowadays require that when you get a bill of lading from your fuel company, from your distributor, you know, that piece of paper, three-part paper, one may be a pink one, one is a yellow one, one is a white one, that tells you how many gallons was picked up and how many gallons were delivered, and it was si- it is usually signed by the driver that drops it off. You need to keep at least one of those copies close to your register so an inspector can come by anytime and check and see if you have all your bill of lading for fuel at the store. I usually keep about six months, last six months worth of bill of lading is in a file where a cashier can access that. So anytime uh, anybody comes in from Department of Environmental Management, uh, they can access that and see how much fuel we're buying and at what frequency. I know it is a law in Alabama and I have a feeling this is the law in all other states. So that is one thing you can Keep. That is one good record keeping that you have to do. Now, secondly, as far as compliance go, this is where it can get a little bit tricky. Let's say 20 years ago, even 15 years ago, when there was no computerized leak detection system or inventory management system like Vidaroot. I keep mentioning the word Vidaroot. It's V-E-E-D-E-R. The next word is root, R-O-O-T. It's a brand name. And there are other type of companies that produces similar devices. But most of the gas station, I would say about 80% of them carry this brand. So I keep saying Vidaroot. Uh, 
but it, in your store, it could be made by somebody else. And it is a small, let's say, 18 inch by 12 inch device that sits on the wall with a small LCD display and it has a small printer. So every time you hit print, it prints out a small piece of paper that shows you how much fuel you have in the tank. Also shows how much water you have in the tank. And also there has to, there is usually a green light, meaning everything is working properly. And there is a red light in the event there is a leak detection or any other types of error, it will start beeping and the red light will start flashing. So the reason I'm mentioning this, 20 years ago, there were not very many of these machines installed in gas stations. Back then, there was one piece of paper that we had to fill out every day that was, used to be called tank and meter reconciliation. What we did every day is we would go out to the pumps and every MPD, every fuel dispenser has a mechanical number that rolls. You can hardly see it because nowadays most of the pumps are electronic, so they don't show that anymore. But it used to be at the bottom side of the pump, there was a small window where there was like, I'm sure if you've seen any of the older cars, you've seen those odometer where they used to roll from 9 to 10 to 11 to 12 and things like that. So there were numbers. So we would write down the starting numbers. And then at the end of the day, we would write down the closing numbers and deduct that to see how many gallons we sold, even though our register most likely would give us a printout, but we would still have to match it with by each pumps. And then we would have to add the delivery. Every time we got, we received a load of fuel, we would add that and then subtract the sales. So at any given moment, we would have what should be our inventory as of today. And if we go out and measure the tank with that big stick, I'm not sure any of you have seen that, but if you recall 10, 12 years ago, you have seen in gas stations where they have a long wooden stick that they would stick into the ground, into the tank, and then pull it out and see how much gas they have and write it down. And then there is a chart that they would match with the chart. Let's say when I measured the tank, it showed 32 inches of regular gasoline. I don't know how much 32 inch means. So there is a chart that I would go back to the store and look at that chart and the 32 inch gasoline would translate into, let's say, 4,200 gallons. Then I would write in my report that there is 4,200 gallons of regular fuel as of today. So anytime anybody comes to inspect, they would see that, yes, I'm keeping a tank and meter reconciliation and I'm writing down all the fuel deliveries that I'm receiving and I'm deducting all the sales. So at any given moment, I can see what my inventory should be versus what my inventory truly is. And if there is a difference, I have to write that down like overage or shortage. Uh, and uh, every day there would be one gallon over, one gallon short. But if that overage goes to, let's say, 50 gallons a day for a couple of days in a row, then there is a problem. That means either there is a leak or in the event that you're losing gas, then there is a leak. But in the event you're gaining gasoline, then you're not gaining gasoline. That means water is getting inside the tank. So that was the safety net that we all used to do. Now, we don't have to do that anymore because that machine does it all for us. So anytime an inspector shows up, all they do is they go to the video route or those uh, devices that I'm talking about. They print out a report and that tells them the health of uh, the tanks and uh, the last delivery and how much the delivery was and how many gallons we sold and whatnot. So you see, computers and technology have, has improved drastically where it reduced some of our work. So in your state and in your store, in your gas station, if you have those devices installed, then you may not have to do that. But instead of me telling you that you don't have to do that, I would say go to your department's, uh, your state's environmental department's website and see what's required of you to keep. Also, if you cannot get anybody in that Department of Environmental Rev uh, Services, you can also ask your fuel supplier. Ask them, what type of documentation do you have to carry to comply with the local law? 
and I'm sure they will tell you what needs to be done, which I do not think is a lot of work. First thing is, in order to be in compliance, you have to register your tank and renew it every year. In Alabama, we renew it every year, and I'm, I think it costs about a couple of hundred dollars for two tanks. Um, not sure where you are or how much that would be in your state, but I'm sure uh, you can. Uh, they will either send you an invoice every year or you can ask your fuel distributor how to get that done. You can also find that information through the government website for that department. Uh, if you can find out what's the name of the department, just type it on, type it on to Google and, and find out how to register your tanks or how to renew your tanks registration. So that is the number one thing that makes sure the tanks are registered. And second thing is make sure you keep all your fuel delivery logs. I, when I say logs, it's really keep a log of all the bill of lading. So that is the num number two. And number three is see if you have a machine such as what I was describing, like Vitarood, that keeps up everything as far as how much water you have and whatnot. If you don't have that, ask your fuel distributor if you have to manage or write down by hand those tank to meter reconciliation report. Because there are formats nowadays that you can get that are you can put it on a Microsoft Excel and just fill in those blanks every day instead of handwriting it. But one good thing is you don't have to go out to the pumps anymore to write down those numbers. I remember years ago where we would have to go out with a flashlight at night just to see and read those numbers. Those were very hard to do because every MPD had three numbers, one for regular, one for plus, one for premium. So those days are long gone now. So it's, it has become much easier but still, if you want to be completely uh, within the regulation, find out from your local people what else do you have to do to comply with your local regulations. Moving on to number four, question number four. This one came from a gentleman named Rakesh. And he wrote, I'm getting complaints from customers time to time that my gas has water slash dirt in it. I called a local repair company and they told me to call a tank company to wash my tanks. I'm confused. Please help. Rakesh, you're not alone when it comes to this type of problem. I've dealt with it many times. And in my understanding, this is what happens. First of all, when you get a delivery, there are times, depending on the weather outside, there can be a little bit of water mixed into your fuel. But not to worry because gasoline is lighter than water. So what happens is when they drop the fuel in your tank, the water automatically goes to the bottom and the fuel rises to the top. And remember, when you're, somebody's pumping fuel in your station, the pipes are set in a way that it will never draw from the bottom of the tank because there is at least seven or eight inches that it leaves underneath it will never get that fuel or water from the bottom the tanks are designed that way that usually in any type of storage tanks over time it accumulates dirt and, and sand and a lot of different debris so the tanks are designed in a way that it will never draw from the bottom because then they will be drawing a lot of dirt. Because every time the gasoline is being dropped, the, the lid is open and the, you know, a lot of times it's windy outside and it's blowing a lot of sand and, and dirt and whatnot. And they all know that. So they design it in a way so it doesn't pick up anything at the bottom of the tank. And that's why you will notice, let's say your station just ran out of fuel. But when you check your system, your Vita root, it says you still have 700 gallons left in your tank or 500 gallons left in your tank. Why? Because that's the bottom line. That's the bottom beyond the pump. I mean, beyond the pipe. It's below the pipe. So the tanks are designed not to be pumped below, let's say, 500 gallons. And in that 500 gallon, there could be water, there could be debris, uh, uh, there could be sand and mud and whatnot. So that is one reason that happens. So, but I didn't answer your question, I know, but I just wanted you to understand how this works. And secondly, 
we used to sell 100% fuel, but in last four or f- is it five years now, I guess, that the law has changed where now we're all selling ethanol-based fuel. When I say ethanol-based fuel, I mean really fuel mixed with ethanol. And we all know, I'm sure you know if you're in this business, that ethanol comes from corn. It's a byproduct of corn that is similar to gasoline, but not as light as gasoline. But there is a federal mandate, a law that says any gasoline sold in the United States has to be mixed in with ethanol at least by 10%. So every gas station you go to in the United States, you will see a sticker that says, this gasoline contains at least 10% ethanol. Now, why is that a matter when it comes to dirt on your tank or water in your tank? Because ethanol is a product that if it ever comes in contact with a drop of water or any water, it will automatically turn into dirt, a black sludge. So, for example, a lot of the stations faced these problems many years ago and some are still suffering. Let's say all these years when we sold 100% gasoline, we all have or had a little bit of water under the tank because it's due to condensation. Some days it's 100 degrees, some days it's 60 degrees. So when the temperature varies that much, there are condensation and that condensation dew drops can accumulate into, let's say, half an inch of water in a tank. And that's very normal. You can take an average of 50 gas stations, go and print out their Vita Root report, and you will see most of the gas stations will say their tank has at least five gallons of water under the tank. Some will say three gallons, some will say half an inch. You can, uh, it gives you uh, the measurement by two different ways. One is by inch, one is by gallon. And very seldom I see a station that says zero. But in my understanding and in my experience, I think every tank, if it's at least two years old or, or not, or over, uh, there will be at least a gallon or two of water all the way to the bottom. And that's very normal. Don't panic about that because that will never end up in your customer's car because it's going to be all the way to the bottom. But how are customers getting dirt in their car by getting fuel from you? Well, this is how I'm guessing, and you can investigate this since the company that you called said you need to wash your tank. That means they already checked it. And it is easy to check. If you still have one of those wooden stick that measures the tank, how much gasoline it has, there are some paste that you can buy from your fuel equipment places that says water. Its name of that is water paste. All you do is put that paste on the bottom of the stick and then put that stick in your tank to actually measure how much water you have in your tank because the paste from gray color, it will turn red as soon as it touches water. So when you take the stick out, you will get to see how much water it has. If you have a video route, it also t- will tell you that. But when you are having this problem, manually checking it would be the best way. Now, this is what I think is happening that has happened to me a few times. Let's say... You're getting a gas delivery and your tank already has about 15 to 20 gallons of water all the way to the bottom, which is usually not harmful, but it is high water. So I would pump that water out in anything over five or six gallons. I usually like to pump it out and you can call a company, your whoever repairs your pump can do that very easily because again, as I said, water is all the way to the bottom. So what they do is they put a pipe all the way to the bottom of the tank and they vacuum out those five, six, seven gallons of water and there are a little bit of fuel mixed into it and they take it, they dispose it properly and then your tank becomes healthy again. But in your case, my guess is that it is an older facility and when the federal law came into effect that we all have to buy ethanol-based, ethanol-mixed fuel, the suggestion back then was that you need to clean your tank before you put the ethanol-mixed fuel A lot of the gas stations owner didn't listen to that. They did not do it. So when the ethanol mixed fuel came in, whatever water was in that tank became sludge, became black tar, pretty much. 
So what happens afterwards is, let's say you're getting a fuel delivery right now and it's five o'clock rush hour. So let's say the driver comes in and hooks up the hose and starts dropping the fuel into the tanks. You can imagine if thousands of gallons are being poured from 10 feet above, think of the tank itself. Then whatever is at the bottom, all the dirt at the bottom are being stirred up and now they are floating uh, around all over the tank. And right at that moment, a couple of your customers come in and starts pumping fuel. What are they getting? They're getting that mixture of dirt and fuel at the same time. Because the truck is still unloading that fuel and they're dropping it from at least five or six feet above the ground. I mean, uh, from the ground that at the tank is sitting under the ground. So there is a distance of six, seven feet. And if you drop anything from that high, you're steering up all the dirt. And that's what happens. Now, Rakesh, uh, your company that came, the repair company that told you to call a tank company to wash the tanks are telling you the truth. This is the best way to handle it. But it is expensive as well. So I'm not sure how much or where you are. uh, But in Alabama, I know last time we did that for two tanks, one was 6,000 gallon and one was 10,000 gallon tank. And it cost us about $2,200, if I'm not mistaken. Because what they do is they would have to come out, pump all the fuel out of the tank, and then they do some type of cleaning with, um, they have a system. I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but it takes them all day to do it. And they take all the sludge out, and uh, they vacuum it out, they dry it, and then they put the fuel back in. So that is one way to handle that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, there is one way you can prevent any more future disasters such as that. One way would be if you already know that your tank has this type of sludge and water, then when the truck comes to deliver fuel, as soon as the truck pulls up, bag all your nozzles off like you're out of fuel. Don't let any customer pump fuel. My advice would be to bag I'm sure you, if you're in this business, you already know there are bags that you put on nozzles that looks like this station is out of gas or for some other reason, they're not letting anybody pump fuel. So use those bags or any shopping bags for that matter. I've seen people use those. So just bag those off every nozzle while the driver, the fuel delivery driver is dropping the full fuel. And once the driver is done, with dropping the fuel, don't open the pumps. Wait another 15 minutes at least. Let the dust settle down at the bottom again. Then open the pumps back up. You will eliminate this problem. But I'm sure these customers that are complaining, you may have to give them something for free and make sure the word does not spread because it is a bad marketing for your business. One guy gets bad gasoline, they can go tell 50 people that, hey, don't go there because my car ran really rough after I bought fuel from that station. Remember, when something good you do, people don't mention it to others as often as they do when you do something terrible or even remotely something not as good. So people share bad news more so than the good ones. So be very careful. And as I said, until you get the tanks cleaned up, make sure to not let anybody get fuel while the truck is delivering the fuel and wait at least 15 minutes after that. Hopefully I was able to answer your question. Any other questions any of you may have, please send it to me and I will include that in the next Q&A session. And I'm sure you all know where to send me questions. It is my name, Shabir, S-H-A-B-B-I-R, at gasstationbusiness101.com. That's the email address. You can also post it on our Facebook group. And to find our Facebook group, the best way to do it is, again, type my name, my whole name, shabirhossein.net. It is a domain redirect that takes you straight to Facebook. And the only reason I did that, because I know most of you, 
are already on Facebook at least for five minutes a day to check with your friends and your family and whatnot. So if you happen to think of a question, post it there. If I don't get to answer it, I'm sure there are enough members out there with enough knowledge that one of them can answer that for you. If you're about to buy a gas station for the first time, for any listeners that haven't gotten into this business and are still contemplating if they should get into this business and they want to find out more, you know, I've written a few books and one of those books is a very tiny one that gives you a very precise, I should say, very precise uh, ideas about gas station business and how to figure out if a station is making money or not. So if you want to read a small book that tells you some of these basic things, instead of reading the first, very first book that I wrote back in 2012, you can read this book, which I published about seven, eight months ago. And the name of the book is Gas Station Business Smart Startup. And you can find this book in any place from Amazon to iTunes to Barnes & Noble, everywhere online. And in this book, I talk about how to measure profitability, how to come up with evaluation, how to calculate return on investment, how to write a business plan, how to get financing for your new venture. But no, I'm not giving you a lot of information on bank's name, where to go and how to finance. I'm giving you ideas as far as what you need, what type of documents you need to get a business financed. So as I said, it's a small book, but it gives you the basic knowledge before you go dive in and buy a business for hundreds of thousands of dollars. This would get you started. Now, if you're interested in learning more about small business and gas station marketing strategies, you know, my background is in marketing and that one thing I have done all through my life and this is a passion for me. Marketing has always been. So there is a book that I wrote and I'm sh I've shared that with many of you before and I just thought I would mention that you can check out that book. It's called Sales Genie. You know, like that genie in the bottle, it's Sales Genie, Retail Marketing 101. That's the name of the book. And again, you can find this book online in any stores from Amazon to Kobo, iTunes and everywhere else. And again, in this book, I show you five proven ways to increase your retail sales and boost profit by at least 25% in just 60 days. So if you're interested in retail marketing, if you want to boost your sales, take a look at that book. And, and again, I, you may read the book and say, well, you told me all this or some of these in different episodes of podcast. Of course I did. Because... I share my knowledge in this podcast and some of these knowledge I share or I write down in a book as well because I'm the same person who's writing the book and doing this podcast. So don't blame me later on saying that, hey, I already knew because you told me that in episode such and such, but there is a book that summarizes it all. So if you want to read that, by all means, take a look at it. Now, lastly, as I said, I would love to see a review from you on the iTunes store or wherever you download this episode from. It could be Blueberry. It could be, you know, there are, I, know, I don't even know how many places there are out there that host podcasts. I know there are at least 10, but I only know of iTunes. But I know the way my, our software works is it takes it to different places. So I don't even know where you get this episode from. But wherever it is, if you can... Put some good words or bad for that matter if you don't like the episode uh, on iTunes so I can improve myself. But in the event you do a good review, it will make me reach more listeners like you. Because the way iTunes works is if more people put up reviews, they put the show up on the top. And that means they it reaches more listeners. So which will be helpful for me. Lastly, don't forget to sign up for my newsletter and I have found a designer finally that will be doing all the import from my current email uh, platform to the new one because you know I've told you that I haven't sent out any emails in about last two and a half months because I've been waiting for this migration to take place 
And it is a tricky one, but the new one is so much better that I've been paying their monthly subscription fees for last five months, but haven't been able to transfer myself to the new platform. So it will happen. So don't forget to sign up for my newsletter because once I migrate to the new platform, all the emails that I haven't sent out will be coming your way. And I've noticed that when you sign up, there is a book that I promised that I I was going to give you and I still offer that book, which is the Passive Income book. In the event you don't get it, please email me and I will send it to you for free, of course. Once again, thank you for joining me. Any question you have, feel free to send me an email or post it on my Facebook. Take care. This has been the one and only Gas Station Business 101 podcast with your host, Shabir Hossein. This podcast was brought to you by CSB Academy Publishing Company. Be sure to join us next time as we share with you the secrets about how to start and operate a gas station business successfully and make money.